This podcast may contain explicit language. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast, the show that uses a unique grading style to redefine what the greatest movies are. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight, in this special episode, we give you our top 10 1950s movies. But before we quickly get to the show, next week we will be discussing a movie that you probably have known in your background at one time or another, but that is celebrating its 25th anniversary, Good Will Hunting, directed by Gus Van Sant, written by... Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, starring Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Casey Affleck, Robin Williams, and Stellan Skarsgård. You won't want to miss that one, so please watch ahead of the episode by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. You can also email the show at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com to sign up for our newsletter, or find us on Instagram, Twitter, or now TikTok at the handle at Podcast. And as always... Please like, follow, rate, and review the show on whichever podcast platform you use. We would really appreciate it. All right, Dad, I know this has probably been a difficult episode to come up with. The top 10 movies of the 1950s. I let you select the decade you picked the 1950s because I think there may not be a decade that excites you more than watching 1950s movies. But before we get to our top 10s, do you want to give your honorable mentions, the ones that just missed the cut? Well, I will. Um, first, though, I had to develop my own criteria of what I did to evaluate. So I'm going to just tell you, everyone, what I did. I had five points. One, the quality of the movie in general. Two, the legacy of the movie. How well the movie is known today and how popular it is in the general public. The acting, the directing and how the movie resonates with me individually. So before you go too much further, I want to say that when we normally do the show, we're talking about the greatest movie of all time, and we break it down into these segments because we find that greatness can be measured, but best usually means a completely different thing, and it's more subjective. So my list is not based on any criteria. It's which movie did I think was best. And so while I respect your ability to take and do that, I did not follow the same process because I just simply went, which movie do I think is a better movie? Okay. Well, and I did it that way so that I had some way of trying to, I I built a list of what I thought were the best films to begin with. And I started out with a list of like uh, 24, I think, films. And then I peered off the first uh, seven or eight and, Then I got down to like 18 or 16 or something like that. And then I got it down and I really had to scramble for the last or to get it from like 14 to 10. But my honorable mention won The Searchers. And the only reason that this kind of falls off is, is there are a lot of movie fans, people who are in the know, who do not readily think of this film. It's considered probably one of the great Westerns of all time, but there are, it's not one of those films that seems to always be someone's favorite. And the other thing about this, and again, being very subjective, I have had a hard time every time I've watched it, understanding how somebody's vengeance could be so much that they would spend years trying to to seek the vengeance that they feel. So to me, it's never understood. And I think more than anything, it's just never resonated with me because I don't understand it. The other one is Vertigo. That would be the number 11, or excuse me, number 12 on my list. Again, you know, Hitchcock is my favorite, probably my favorite director. I just never understood exactly the whole concept. It's a little weird and a little creepy as he's trying to convert uh, her into his ideal woman again. And uh, I just never completely understood it and do not appreciate it as much as 
a lot of film critics do. I'm not a critic. I mean, I'm just somebody who watches and loves films and watches a lot of them and pays attention. I would beg to differ. I think you're an amateur critic. You've been doing this long enough and we've done enough movies now. I think you could consider yourself an amateur critic. Okay. So if I get paid a dollar, does that make me a professional? Sure. Okay. You don't have some of the same credentials as the other professionals, but sure. Okay. Uh, and then number 11, and this was a tough one for me too, is All About Eve. The sub, to me, the subject has always been so heavy that I just have had a hard time. I, I, I think it's a great film, but it's just not been one of those films that I naturally love. I'll admit this one, I had a hard time with this one also because I have not seen it probably in 15 years. And maybe if I watched it again, it would be on the top 10 list. But I struggled between it and uh, number 10. Fair enough. So I have a list of the top 30 movies because, of course, I ended up being a little bit over the top in my preparation of this. I am your son, after all. But I also didn't think it would be fair to get to a top 10 without going to pretty much adding in every movie that I thought was at least worthy of being on the list. It happened to be 30 of them. I also have a list of the 20 movies that I need to see on which there are some fairly big movies that I think from an international market or uh, an international critic appeal need to probably have been seen. And this list could be very easily revisited or redone once I've seen a bunch of those movies, including The Seventh Seal, Tokyo Story, Touch of Evil, The Night of the Hunter, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, etc., etc., etc. There are a list of 20 on there that I haven't seen. But if you would like to see my full ranked list of 30 and that other list of 20 that I still need to see, at least ones that you could consider in the top, I would say, 50 movies of the 1950s, you can click the link in the show description or the show notes there at the bottom, and it'll take you right there to that list so that you can see what my full list of 30, at least right now, of the ones I've seen is. But I'll start with my honorable mention at 15, a movie that makes your list, so I won't go too much into it, especially since we've done this show as our second episode, as well as a revisit a couple of weeks ago, and that's North by Northwest from 1959 an Alfred Hitchcock movie. It is my favorite Alfred Hitchcock movie, which I've said on multiple occasions. It is not the top Alfred Hitchcock movie of the 50s, as far as I'm concerned, for best, but it is a worthy inclusion at number 15. Number 14, a movie we covered last year, and that would be The Seven Samurai. I would say that it is actually Kurosawa's second best film, but often said to be his first and he made a lot of great movies in the 1950s, some of which made this list and some which did not. But I think you could easily count Yojimbo and uh, you could put Throne of Blood, which is basically his adaptation of Hamlet to Japanese samurai and some of the other ones. But I won't go too far. If you want to listen to that episode, go back to our back catalog. Number 13, a movie that is also on your list, so I won't touch it too much, but we also have done an episode on this one. I think it was either number five or number six. Some Like It Hot from 1959, so I'll bring it back around in a little bit. A mo another movie that is on your list of your top ten, so again, I won't touch it too far. High Noon, which for a while was our number one movie on the greatest movie list. And finally, number 11, I had On the Waterfront, another movie that is on your list, so as the common theme goes, I'm not going to go too far into all of these as, as uh, they're appropriately on your list or not. Uh, we'll discuss them when we get to them. So before we get to the top 10, any broad comments you want to make on what you thought necessarily qualified as best? I guess the one that's really the most prominent is how well it resonated with me individually. Did it say something to me that I've made made this special to me? And so again, it's a it's a very subjective thing. That's why we use the rubric. This has no rubric per se. So this is again just me spitballing. All right. So without further ado, your number ten movie. Uh, North by Northwest. 
suave and debonair Cary Grant, uh, Eva Marie Saint playing the part uh, very well um, and, and showed that she had some acting chops. James Mason playing a villain was just phenomenal. And Hitchcock's mastery of suspense and being able to make a film that was really good without saying anything. I mean, they don't even tell you exactly what it is that the basis of the movie is. Van Damme is uh, kind of an import-exporter of secrets. That's all it says. You have no idea exactly what is going on. But it's all about the film itself and the filmmaking. Uh, years in the making, I think North by Northwest was the 10th, at least the, well, in my opinion, was the 10th best movie of the decade. Again, it is my favorite, and I would direct everybody to either our original episode or the revisit episode we did a couple of weeks ago. I think it is a worthy entry, but I just found that there were several other movies I thought were a little bit better. We had commented a couple of weeks ago that this is maybe the original James Bond movie and kind of creates the archetype for not only guy who is caught up in a case of mistaken identity, but also kind of in a roundabout way creates the gentleman spy genre. My number 10 movie, though, goes in a slightly different direction. And it is a movie that is higher up on your list and is actually your number nine. So we can talk about it here, but it is From Here to Eternity, the 1953 Best Picture winner, starring Burt Lancaster, Montgomery Clift. And this movie tells the story of enlisted men in basically Hawaii around Pearl Harbor, just up before the events of Pearl Harbor and taking place in that. And the title gets its name from basically you're screwed from here to eternity because it's a bunch of guys meandering around, not sure what to do with themselves, hanging out on an army base and getting into all sorts of trouble because their lives really don't mean anything up until the point where the Japanese attack and all of a sudden they are thrust into a war that they didn't see coming. The reason I went with it is number nine. This is a film that's extremely well done. It was a Best Picture winner. Uh, it basically reinvigorated, uh, reinvigorated Frank Sinatra's career. His wife at the time, I believe, was Ava Gardner, who had to go to the studio and threaten to walk on her contract if they didn't cast Frank in it, and built Ernest Borgnine's career. And I think it was just a really good movie. Uh, it kind of allowed Donna Reed also to have a second career because, you know, she kind of floundered around after It's a Wonderful Life and such. From here, she went into doing television and had a long career playing uh, in a sitcom as a mother. But uh, I think it had a significant impact on entertainment in general. It's just a good film. It's something you can sit and watch and not have to think a lot and can just enjoy the performances and the movie itself. You forgot to mention that not only did Frank Sinatra star in this one, but I believe he won Best Supporting Actor for his performance in this movie. You might be right. I haven't. I didn't look at that. Again, I think it's a collection of one of the best casts of this decade and definitely a worthy entry into our top ten. My number nine film is a movie that is higher up on your list, so I won't go too far into it. But that's a movie we already discussed and has to be one of the best moments of the show so far, The Bridge on the River Kwai from 1957, directed by David Lean, starring Alec Guinness. I think they both won Best Director and Best Actor, respectively, for this particular movie. It tells the story of British soldiers in a Japanese POW camp working on a bridge to basically help a railroad across the River Kwai. What is your number eight movie? I have On the Waterfront. It's uh, Eva Marie Saint. It's Carl uh, Malden. It's Steiger. It's Brando. It's Lee J. Cobb. Um, I mean, it's just a phenomenal film. I've always loved Carl Malden both in this and in uh, Patton in uh, Streetcar. He did the TV show. Um, I always thought Carl Malden was an underrated actor. 
And uh, this is just a raw film. I believe Eli Kazan directed. Yes, it's one of, I think, multiple Oscars that he won for Best Director, as this also won Best Picture in 1954. So I just thought it was an extremely powerful film talking about labor and all of the problems that are existing with it and its ties to sometimes organized crime. I think this film, in part, led to some of the uh, Kefauver investigations later in the 50s into organized crime and specifically brought uh, certain labor leaders like Jimmy Hoffa into prominence for investigative purposes. So it was kind of a muckraking film on top of everything else being so good. Again, a very talented cast, one of the most awards-heavy recognized movies of the decade. As I mentioned, it is the Best Picture winner from 1954, I think for the most part, though, the most seminal thing known about this movie happens to be Marlon Brando's performance, one of his multiple Best Actor Award wins, the other one, I believe, for The Godfather, and the one before this for Streetcar Named Desire. I think if you asked most actors and professionals, maybe directors, what are the top five best acting performances of all time that would not nominate Terry Malloy and Marlon Brando for this movie in that category. And so I think it buoys the movie. This was very close for me. I think if I mentioned it correctly, it was in my honorable mentions as my number 11 film. It just missed the cut. I unfortunately thought there were a couple of other films that just elbowed it out. I think for the most part, if I were to have any issues why this is maybe not higher on the list, is simply that while Lee J. Cobb, I think it's, Again, and I I think I mentioned this when we did our top 10 character actor performances. I mentioned that Lee J. Cobb is a great villain for another movie we're going to talk about later on in the list. But he's also absolutely spectacular as the crime boss labor leader on the docks in this movie. But for me, it just doesn't connect with me in the same way that some of the other movies are higher on the list. I don't know if I quite understand all the nuances of waterfront and what do you want to call it? Dock labor strife. And so maybe it just is a little bit more removed from me than some of the other movies that are higher up on this list, but certainly one of the top movies of the 1950s. So that was your number eight. My number eight was a movie that you mentioned in your honorable mention and is currently, I think at least to this point, the sight and sound poll, at least directors, number one movie of all time. It is a movie that has only gotten better legacy as time has gone on, as originally it was not given much thought, but it is quite literally the, it is either this movie or the movie that he did in 1960, Psycho, that are the epitome of what Alfred Hitchcock's career seemed to be about, and that was Obsession. Vertigo from 1958 starring James Stewart and Kim Novak, is possibly one of the most stylistically well-done movies that you will ever see. It is a complete auteurs film. I don't know if the script necessarily gives me the same connection, but I think there's a reason that it ranks more highly for directors than the general audience at large. I think there are more popular Hitchcock films, and even among necessarily actors or critics, this isn't the top film overall, maybe not even of Hitchcock's, but it's, I don't think it ever makes it outside of the top three at this point, but more than anything, directors really have a commentary on this because of the quick cutting, the stylistic behind of how you present Vertigo and James Stewart's performance in this movie as the detective investigating the wife of a friend after he has an accident that causes him to have repeated Vertigo from Heights. And what he ends up going through through the course of that movie to the final surprise that is at the end of the movie and the or possibly one of the most notable endings in a Hitchcock movie ever. So what is your number seven on the list? Uh, Some like it hot. Billy Wilder is phenomenal. Great director. And uh, performances of Tony Curtis, Jack Lemmon, Marilyn Monroe. 
I don't think people pre everybody knows Marilyn Monroe as a sex symbol. I don't think they really appreciate her as an actress. I happen to have seen the seven year itch. I thought she was very good in that. I think she's phenomenal in this film uh, and really showed her ability to be a performer and actress. I, I just love the film. I thought it was extremely well done. It was way ahead of its time and, um, you know, merits being on the list, and I have it at seven simply because, I mean, it, it could very well have been as high as four for me, but I, I I had other films that I ranked higher, just barely. So for the context of this one, again, I think this is a film that we did either number five or number six in the course of this show. And it may require a revisit at some time or another, but this has to be one of the most audacious and novel films for a 1950 film that could possibly make it onto this list. Accompanied by some of the best performances comedic wise of Tony Curtis and Jack Lemons that you'll probably ever see. And while some of the humor is quite dated and seems not nearly as novel now in hindsight, given the current issues of our time. At the time, this is probably as forward thinking as you could have possibly gotten away with in the 1950s. It's a miracle that this thing was made. I wouldn't go quite that far because it was very common for Milton Berle to to do characters in drag in the early 50s. This was just taking it one step further. And yet, with still near the end of the Hayes Code, and you still had, I I think this is a couple of years after McCarthy kind of fell out of rapport, Hollywood was still a bit sensitive to certain topics and branching over them. So I'm not sure that uh, unless you had the clout of how good this movie actually ends up being, that it, it necessarily is something you would have automatically given a stamp of approval to. My number seven on the list is a movie we covered also last year, which has to be one of the preeminent film noirs and a Mount Rushmore movie for a Mount Rushmore potential director in Billy Wilder, and that's Sunset Boulevard from 1950. Oddly enough, I mean, I'm not sure many people would watch this on a whim, But once you do, and if you have any appreciation for movies, you can see the artistry clearly noted in this film about a struggling writer from Hollywood or screenplay writer who is finding it difficult to catch on, all of a sudden ending up living with a star of the silent film era and finding that there's more under the surface than meets the eye. It was nominated, I believe, for Best Picture as well as a number of other awards and definitely one of the top movies of Billy Wilder's career. And since he defined a lot of what happened in the 1950s, it is a worthy entrant on my list at number seven. We will talk about it more when it comes up a little bit higher on your list. What is your number six? High Noon, Gary Cooper and uh, Grace Kelly. Yes, this is my number 12 in honorable mention, and I also believe that uh, this had a lot of more historical value than anything else. Well, and yes, because the film in a large way was meant kind of as a th- nose or, th- you know, thumbing of the nose to the blacklist. And uh, I just, I, I think that the film itself is so well done and shows uh, the power of one man. And in this particular case, again, it was ahead of its time because one of the things that prevented her, because John Wayne turned the script down, was because the portrayal of Grace Kelly helping to save Gary Cooper, who was her husband, uh, in the end of the film, the portrayal of females actually having some ability to redeem the situation and I think again it was ahead of its time as a result of that it's a film I had seen when I was younger did not appreciate and then once we went back and watched it again for the show I had a very new appreciation and a much more mature understanding of what the film was and what it was trying to say 
And so I give it my ranking as number six. It's oddly enough, a very interesting movie from the standpoint that the time lapse from the beginning to the end, I believe is an hour and 15 minutes. And you count down from about 11 a.m. till noon and then the final gunfight at the end. And the runtime, I think, is only about 75 minutes long. But that's the entire length of the time in the movie. And so unlike a lot of other movies, things seem to be happening exactly in real time. It only takes 75 minutes to get all the revolving action within the course of the movie. And from that standpoint alone, it makes this a unique entry on the course of this list. But it also is the number one movie where it was fighting against what Hollywood was becoming and kind of thumbed its nose at Hollywood at the time. We've done some redux work on what should have won Best Picture in 1952, partially because the last film on our list happens to be the Best Picture winner from that year. But (laughs) with that being said, this has to be one of the seminal movies of the 1950s and probably was only not appreciated in real time because of its narrative of a guy standing alone to do what's right against the rest of the town when no one else is willing to help him and what it said about Hollywood at the time, particularly as it related to the blacklist. My number six is a movie that was in your honorable mention from 1956, possibly John Ford's best film, The Searchers. You mentioned the course of the film has to do with vengeance and with avenging the deaths of several primary characters from the beginning of the film follows the course of John Wayne's character trying to save his niece from potential death, dismemberment, or and or rape from a warring Native American tribe. And while there has been some backlash in more recent years as a nuanced take of how it maybe is not sympathetic towards Native Americans at the time and presents them in a fairly, for lack of a better term, savage-like appearance, This movie still has a lot of resonation because of what it probably kicked off. I think more than any other film, this is presenting what the next, or basically all of Westerns that came after it. Before this, Westerns were not nearly as anti-hero as they became. You had some elements of it, but oftentimes it was the white hat with a gun versus the black hat with a gun, and it was very black and white, very lacking in nuance. This movie, while Ford was known for most of his westerns, features some of the best cinematography outside of maybe Lawrence of Arabia of the time. It's sweeping shots of mesas in, I think this takes place in either Arizona or New Mexico, is absolutely gorgeous. Some of the camera work in this movie is beyond what you would think of of any non-master director and certainly was one of Ford's best entries of all time and probably John Wayne's best performance single-handedly. I can agree with you. Again, I I had indicated why it was my honorable mention, but um, it, it just didn't play as well to me because of the vengeance aspect. I just have never understood it and it doesn't resonate with me. I just learned more or less to let certain things go. So before we get to your number five entry, let's take a quick break and we will be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for rejoining us. Dad, what is your number five movie on your top 10 1950s movies list? Sunset Boulevard. Um, You've already addressed some of it, but Gloria Swanson's portrayal in this <laughs> was just phenomenal. She had a, an uncanny ability to go from being just generally strange to borderline psychotic and just did it without over or going over the top to being unbelievable. Just a very well-crafted film. I think in large part it was very critical of Hollywood in general And what happens with stars or people that are cast off from prominence at the same time, those struggling on the way up. So we have the extremes of both sides of Hollywood, those that made it and have fallen on the wayside 
and those who never make it. And these two cross. It's certainly an indictment of star treatment and celebrity culture, but also delusion and delusions of grandeur and what enabling can do to sometimes people instead of accepting reality. It's also got one of the only notable performances by a dead chimpanzee (laughs) on these lists. Yes. All right. My number five on my list is a movie that is possibly one of my top favorite movies of all time. It is actually the second best courtroom, per se, drama of the period, but it is a movie that comes up later on your list, so I will not address it quite at this time, but that's 12 Angry Men, Sidney Lumet's directorial debut starring Henry Fonda, but also one of the most star-studded casts of the 1950s at the time. I know you probably don't all recognize a lot of the names, but it's character actors that were involved in just about everything. But, so as not to steal your thunder, we'll talk about that in a minute. What is your number four movie on your list? The Bridge on the River Kwai. It's just a uh, extremely well done film. It portrays the struggles associated with being a prisoner of war in very brutal conditions. At the same time, you know, it indicates a, a psychological break. Alec Guinness is trying to look at some method by which he can psychologically allow his troops to survive emotionally and mentally the the turmoil by you know having something to look forward to something that has some meaning giving them purpose yeah purpose is a good word unfortunately he's so focused on that He forgets the fact that this is going to assist the enemy in the furtherance of their efforts in the war. And it's not until the end that he suddenly understands what exactly he did. Again, another fine performance by Bill Holden. He was so good in those uh, films. I, one of the films that just fell off of my honorable mention was another Bill Holden film, Salog 17, another Billy Wilder film uh, that I think is really phenomenal. I'm looking forward to when we do that one for the show in the future. And, um, you know, I just thought the film was very, very well done. I think it pretty much cemented David Lean as basically a director of epics. And uh, he didn't need to do a whole lot after when you consider he did Bridge on the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, and uh, Dr. Shivago. Yes, he notably has three of the biggest epics of all time. Certainly, as we got further along in the 50s, we became less limited in scope, not just from the musicals that were produced, one of which is going to come up later on both of our lists at the same spot, but also in just what was capable from a scenery, environment, and level of scale to which was available for directors at the time. David Lean, more than any other director, challenged the notion of what was possible as far as set and set design in the late 1950s, and this is the first of his major entries. I would say Lawrence of Arabia is possibly a better cinematography movie as well as setting and production design but this one isn't very far behind and has some of the most magical views of any world war ii movie that i've ever seen so my number four entry did not even make your honorable mention or your top 10 it is a movie i don't think you've seen other than maybe 10 minutes i tried to show you once and you were not familiar with which is odd for me because when i first saw this movie in college it was presented to me as a movie film title that resonated within the legal community for what it is to have different witness accounts. And that is the Akira Kurosawa seminal classic Rashomon. Told of the story from multiple different perspectives of a murder that takes place in a Japanese post-war village and how it's told from different witness perspectives during the middle of this court case and how that is presented Each account is different from the last in varying degrees in how it presents the case. And the cases 
solely decided on the base of the witness accounts. If you have not seen the movie, it is probably one of Kurosawa's shortest films. He's known very much for very long sweeping epics like we covered with The Seven Samurai. But this is a movie that we have destined for later in the year, which I'm going to be absolutely thrilled to talk about when we get to it. I have very little familiarity with it, so I had no ability to really indicate you know, anything about it or to have any indication that it had any resonance with me. That's quite all right. So your number three movie on your list was also my number five. Twelve Angry Men. First of all, Henry Fonda is phenomenal. Henry Fonda was, you know, is known for being a movie star, but Henry Fonda, I think, was a better stage actor than a uh, movie star. I think even if you read anything about him, even he thought that. And some of his better performances, 12 Angry Men, uh, Mr. Roberts, were movie adaptations of the stage play that he was in. And in this particular case, he just had an ability of pacing and of presentation that made it look live, like you were watching a play. And you look at the cast they had, of the 12 jurors, 10 of them have went on to be, or either were huge character actors and well, or very prominent at the time, or went on to be huge uh, character actors and stars in and of themselves. Martin Balsam went on and did a bunch of different things, including uh, Psycho. Uh, Robert Weber, who did a ton of stuff with Blake Edwards in the Pink Panther movies, Victor Victoria, 10. Jack Klugman went on and did Broadway and played Felix, or excuse me, played Oscar Madison, then did the TV show. Uh, John Fiedler is in it, who had parts on the Bob Newhart show and was most known for being the voice of Piglet in the Winnie the Poof series. So, I mean, these guys just all turned in really good performances. And maybe, again, this resonates with me so well is because this is the ideal of what you would hope a jury does. I have no misgivings that Jack uh, Warden, who's uh, more interested in making the ball game and wants to get out of there, uh, is more like the normal juror than the rest. But again, that's why this movie is so good to me. I absolutely adore the movie. I think it is one of the best representations of a feeling that I've gotten as being a defense attorney's son, that of the lost cause, but fighting for the person who doesn't seem like they have a defense. And it's one of the few movies that ever seems like we shouldn't throw the book at somebody. It is the preeminent defense attorney's film. But the defense attorney plays almost no good role in this movie, because it's going through the American judicial process of a jury of your peers. It is a one of one. You do not have anything like it. And as I've said multiple times on the course of this show, we love film or stage adaptations that are made into movies because of the dialogue. This has some of the best written dialogue back and forth. It is a very tight, well-directed film. And as you mentioned, some of the biggest stars delivering some of their best performances. Henry Fonda and Lee J. Cobb are absolutely phenomenal in this movie. And there's a reason that for probably a good eight-year stretch of my high school and college career, I tried to get every theater director that I was ever around to do this this play so that I could play the Henry Fonda role. And then when we did this movie for the course of the show, I finally came to or came around to saying, Actually, I'd love to do the Lee J. Cobb role because I think it's that much harder. And I can't say enough good things about this movie because it's one of my all-time favorites. All right, so my number three, I'm not going to give at the moment because it is your number one. So we will skip ahead. And what is your number two? It is also my number two. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. So Clockwork Orange does not qualify as a 1950s movie? Yeah. It's Singing in the Rain. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't uh, in between each line, kick a guy on the ground. 
Yes, certainly while not the film that Gene Kelly was recognized the most for, I think he got a specialty Oscar the year before for his amount of work in a film that won Best Picture for 1951 called An American in Paris. This is probably the movie that most people recognize him the most for, and I think is the most celebrated musical outside of maybe The Sound of Music in Hollywood history. Uh, you can't minimize the work that Donald O'Connor or Debbie Reynolds did in this film. I wouldn't dare. I mean, they were both at the top of their game. I mean, the uh, make them laugh number and dance uh, choreography of Donald O'Connor, <laughs> just uh, every time I watch it, I'm going, how does he do that? If you want more in-depth conversation on this, I would suggest you listen to the first episode of season three. I think it was number 96 or 97 on our overall list, but we both love this movie. It's exceptional from its score to its dance numbers, the amount of things that are done, and it's a really tight, I think, hour and 50 minutes that is just enjoyable from start to finish. So before we get to our number ones, let's take another quick break and we will be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for rejoining us. All right, for our number ones on the list, before we get to those, let's just count back down. Your list was The Searchers, Vertigo, All About Eve at number 11, North by Northwest at 10, 9 was From Here to Eternity, 8 On the Waterfront, 7 Some Like It Hot, 6 High Noon, 5 Sunset Boulevard, 4 The Bridge on the River Kwai, 3 Twelve Angry Men, 2 Singing in the Rain. My list, I had at number 15, North by Northwest, 14, Seven Samurai, 13, Some Like It Hot, 12, High Noon, 11, On the Waterfront, 10, From Here to Eternity, 9, The Bridge on the River Kwai, 8, Vertigo, 7, Sunset Boulevard, 6, The Searchers, 5, 12 Angry Men, 4, Rashomon, 3 is your number one, so I have not given that yet, number two, Singing in the Rain, and your number one is Rear Window. I uh, it was Hitchcock's favorite film. Uh, it is phenomenal. And again, we you talk about this being a you know a stage play. Hitchcock filmed this as if it was going to be a stage play because almost all the action takes place within the apartment with the set behind it and an actual set that he built with the apartment buildings and the scenes to photograph from that level of James Stewart's apartment. You know, he had that concept in mind. And to me, this is the suspense, the thought or the con or the context of murder taking place, normal people being caught up and thrust into unusual circumstances it's it's just so good and it's so Hitchcock and they're the performances right down to Thelma Ritter uh, as the uh, the nurse and her participation in this just so good even Raymond Burr as the villain in this was just phenomenal there's just so little that I I you know the film was entertaining it was paced well there's just Nothing in it that I found to be a real flaw. It's, to me, I I mean, I have a certain proclivity towards North by Northwest because of just the sheer sophistication of it. But Rear Window is so close to being my number one film for all the reasons I've indicated. It's It's just so well done. I remember the first time watching it because you couldn't see it. Hitchcock, before he died, had it pulled and was not available. It was re-released in the uh, in the eighties, or, or may have even been in the early nineties. Because after his death, it had to be re-released so many years afterwards. And uh, I remember watching it for the first time and being just awestruck into how good this film was. I think it is a representation of simpler is better. This has to be one of his most simple concepts as a plot line. James Stewart, a photojournalist, breaks his leg on assignment and ends up spending all of his time in a wheelchair with his photo camera watching all of his neighbors. 
and thinks there is a murder committed and everything takes off of there. I don't think it's too far to say that this is probably Grace Kelly's best performance. It has to be noted as one of Jimmy Stewart's best performances, although ranking Jimmy Stewart's best performances might be like asking what's the best Beatles song. That being said, direct or Alfred Hitchcock with how simplistic this movie is still has a lot of stylistic flair. And I think this ranked number three on my list, primarily from the classicness standpoint, we haven't covered this movie yet, but how well the notion of the theme of voyeurism seems to age in a, a cultural environment now that is dominated by everybody putting their stuff on social media and letting the entire world view your life through your backyard. Well, I mean, the number of times I've, you know, and for business purposes, both for the show and for my office, I've been studying TikTok, watching a lot of TikTok, trying to understand where social media is going. And the number of people who will put on, you know, like, this is my situation following my husband's death and putting details on. And I'm just like, you're putting your most raw and most emotional things up for everybody to look at and comment about. And, and and not to mention the fact that how many podcasts are there that are the, the more popular ones are the real crime dramas. And this is a real crime drama. It's not a real crime drama because it's not an actual case, but it's got that flair to it. Yes. The, People in it are behaving a lot like people who listen to real crime dramas uh, on the radio. They're they're trying to figure out who did it, and and there's a certain element of it, and what's going on, how they're going to prove the case, and all of this. It's the same. It's the same voyeuristic tendencies we have in general. If you like the Hulu show Only Murders in the Building, this is very much the precursor to that. Yes. And so this was my number three. It was your number one. My number one happened to be one of your honorable mentions. It is a film that I think is vastly underrated by the general audience, but appeals to me because of my love of theater and being subversive of Hollywood stardom, where people age out of their careers, midlife crises, what their relation is to critics, and what it says about modern society when it comes to social media and who is allowed to be a critic, who is not, who is replacing somebody within the stage of a career, and what you do when you're kind of forced out to pasture as a former starlet. This movie has to be one of the best acted movies I've ever seen, not just for the 1950s, but overall, with great performances up and down this absolutely loaded cast, and one of the best performances by a supporting actor who only gets, I think, maybe the last third of the movie, but is one of the most sinister villains of all time, to the point where every time he pops up in another movie, I just know instantly or connect his sinister nature from this film to any other performance he's ever been in, George Saunders. My number one overall <laughs> is 1950s All About Eve, which was the best picture winner for that year. I think it still holds the record for most total nominations of 13 for Academy Awards. It notably had two Best Actress nominees as well as two Best Supporting Actress nominees. It has absolutely everything that you could want in a Hollywood movie and is directed by one of the most recognizable Hollywood family names that if you've ever seen TCM, you know exactly who or this name that I'm about to give you, Joseph Mankiewicz. George Sanders just has had such a knack for playing an oily character and doing it with such refinement and precision that he would always come across as being, you You were half the time you watch of his performances, you spend about half of it, is this guy somebody I like or I shouldn't like? And then you realize this guy's just scum. And he played that so well. Absolutely. For a good portion of the film, he is not a part of the primary cast, but he is the snake waiting in the grass, just waiting to be popped up, and when he does, delivers one of the best performances, I think, from a male actor of the 1950s. So those are our lists, our number ones, Rear Window and All About Eve. Any final commentary on these lists? What I hope we're doing is... is 
If you're sitting around some night and you don't know what to watch, as I've said multiple times, we've given you options of some really quality things. Movies did not start 10 years ago. Please look up the catalogs of the history of film and see what's out there. And we've given some suggestions for some very good films that you, I think you will enjoy if you give them a try if you've not seen them before. Absolutely. Where are you headed, cowboy? Nowhere special? Nowhere special. I always wanted to go there. Next week, we will be discussing the 25th anniversary of one of my favorite films of all time, Goodwill Hunting, from 1998. Directed by Gus Van Sant, written by Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, starring Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, Casey Affleck, Robin Williams, and Stellan Skarsgård. You won't want to miss that one, so please watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Please like, follow, rate, and review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that you can join in on our fun. You can also email the show at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com to sign up for our newsletter, or find us on Instagram, Twitter, or now TikTok at the handle at Podcast. The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate FM. <laughs>